Oh, hey, Jason. All right, we are recording. We are live, and folks are filing in. So, Cody, you can take it away. All right, sounds good. Hey, I want to welcome everybody to uh, the first annual Active Aging Rehab and Fitness Summit. Uh, my name is Cody Seip, one of the co-founders of FAI uh, and the vice president. Really excited to have all you guys here, uh, especially if you are new to the Functional Aging Institute family. Definitely want to give you a special welcome. Uh, we have been um, uh, kind of a leader in education for older adult fitness and exercise interventions. Uh, starting in about 2014 is when we first launched our Functional Aging Specialist. We have a tremendous lineup of courses and certifications now many that we've developed and many through some awesome partners and individuals uh, that we've just had um, the, the pleasure and privilege of, of working with. And many of those you're, you're going to see on our summit today. You know, this, uh, this summit is, is new for us because we really wanted to try to find a way to bring together uh, different types of, of allied health professionals and fitness professionals kind of under one roof, having one conversation. You know, we, we really need to link these groups together. And so I really wanted to have an event that focused not just on one or the other, but really brought us together. And I think you'll see that in the lineup that we have. We have a mix of physical therapists and fitness professionals and other professionals. Uh, they're going to bring a lot of great evidence-based education, but also a lot of great experience working with older adults. It's really going to take all of us working together, if we really gonna get this, this growing uh, global population of older adults uh, to live healthy, long lives that are functional and which they're able to do all the things that they love to do for as long as possible. And I know if you've got loved ones that are older, that's something that, that you want for them, that's something you want for yourself, that's something that we're trying to accomplish uh, through FAI and through uh, this summit. So really excited that you guys are here and a special welcome even to uh, students. So all of you students that are in uh, allied health or, or undergraduate or graduate um, um, programs, really excited that you are here, that you are investing uh, in your knowledge, in your skills, in your future, uh, because we need you guys. We definitely need you guys when we look at the future. So welcome to the Active Aging Rehab and Fitness Summit in 2020. Dan? All right, thanks. Uh, for those of you who have never seen Mark Middleton speak before, you are in for a real treat, uh, even via Zoom. This is going to be fun. Mark is an Emmy Award winning broadcaster. He's the founder and CEO of uh, Boulder Broadcasting and Growing Boulder. We've had the privilege of having Mark keynote at our Functional Aging Summits live and every time people come away, they're like, we, we can't get enough of this Mark Middleton guy. If you've not checked out his book, Growing Boulder. It's a fantastic read. And, and I know many of our trainers now, Mark, are giving it away as gifts to their clients. So I love the fact that now I, uh, I record your TV show on PBS and, and my kids are like, you know that guy, <laughs> that, that, that Growing Boulder TV show? So, so that's exciting. Mark is not only a broadcaster and a voice for the aging opportunity, he's actually a seven time Masters swimming world record holder a 10-time U.S. Masters Swimming National Champion. So he's living the walk, not just doing the talk. So Mark, we're going to turn it over to you. Um, right before I do that, I want to ask everyone, because this is a worldwide event. In fact, I already had someone email me at 1 a.m. from uh, Pakistan saying, hey, when does it start? Um, so I want everyone to type in the chat or Q&A where you're from, city, state, time zone, country, where you're tuning in from, because people all around the world are watching. So Mark, please take it away. Thanks so much. No, thank you, Dan. And thank you, Cody. It's always fun to play with FAI. I'm a big fan of everything that you do and uh, all of the trainers and all of the work that they do, which is so critically important. Um, you know, let me offer just a couple of disclaimers right off the top, uh, if I can. I always feel compelled when I talk about Growing Boulder uh, to, to say that Growing Boulder is certainly not about uh, denying the, the reality of our mortality. It's not about ignoring our human condition, but it is uh, about looking at aging through a different lens, one of passion and purpose and possibility and not just loss and limitation. Uh, it's about understanding uh, that we have all been deceived about what's possible as we age. Uh, and, uh, you know, that knowledge, when we do 
understand that we've been deceived, it brings with it a great deal of personal responsibility. We talk about uh, who is our primary care provider today. It's a question we all ask. And, you know, in a very real way, we believe that uh, we are all our primary care provider. It's you. You know, you, the healthcare paradigm moving forward is very much with the individual at the center of healthcare being supported by a fabulous team of surgeons and therapists and, and specialists. But I mean, let's face it, there is nobody that can make people do what needs to be done today in order to live a life that is filled with passion and purpose and possibility into their 80s and 90s and even 100s. It, it falls back upon us. And until we can make people understand that, until we can make everybody believe that they're their primary health provider, we're really not doing our job. So with that said, uh, here is a very short video that uh, reflects the growing boulder ethos to, to get us started. Now is not the time to retire from life. This is not the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of what's next. We're not made to withdraw from life as we get older. We're made to lean in to seize each moment, to value every breath. We're made to be bold and to take risk. We're made to help others and protect the weak in our tribes. We are the most creative, fearless, selfless, passionate, compassionate, empathetic animal that has ever walked the face of the earth. We didn't choose to be all that. It chose us. It's in our DNA. It's who we are. It's time we quit suppressing it and start expressing it. Age is not a disease, it's an opportunity. Something to be grateful for and not ashamed of. Stop apologizing for growing older and be grateful that you are. The truth and the magic is this. If we can change our belief system about aging, we can change the way we age. But the mind believes, the body embraces. Always believe that the rest of your life can be the best of your life. Don't mourn what's lost. Celebrate what remains. Don't identify with limitation. Embrace possibility. Close your eyes and imagine someone who is 60, 80, or even 100. Now imagine more, a lot more. Now, go make it happen. Stop growing older. Start growing bolder. Now, despite that uh, very optimistic view on aging, uh, you know, we have to be realistic. And uh, the average U.S. life expectancy has actually decreased uh, three years in a row from 2016 through 2018. That's the first time that that has happened in 100 years. The last time was 1916, 17, and 18. And back then it was because of the uh, influenza pandemic that we've now learned so much about, but also World War I. Uh, in 2019, the life expectancy in this country did tick up just a little bit to 78.8, uh, but still lower than it was in 2015. And, you know, 2020 is certainly going to go down down again, perhaps significantly. Uh, and I mention all of this because, you know, I can remember when we first started growing bolder and we would say 10,000 people are now turning 55 every day and then it was 10,000 turning 60 and and now 10,000 Americans are turning 70 each and every day uh, and for those of you in other countries you know this age wave is not just in the US it's all over the world uh, and 70 percent of those who are 65 and older will require long-term care uh, but the problem is they don't have any money to pay for it 52 percent of people who are 
are 55 and older now have zero retirement savings. So uh, elder poverty is going to explode in this country and, and no doubt worldwide. And there's also a, a widening care gap. The divorce rate is increasing for people uh, in their 60s and 70s. Families are more fragmented than they ever were. Children are moving further away from home uh, th than they ever have. So there's fewer and fewer people to take care uh, of our elders. And, and so the frail elderly uh, are going to double in this country by 2040. So to put it in terms that uh, you know we all can understand, uh, we have to flatten the frail elderly curve. And the big question is how do we do that? It's, it's not as simple as wearing a mask and social distancing. Uh, the problem is it's going to take years and we have to start now. Uh, and where we're starting from, uh, candidly, is not a great place. You know, World Mental Health Day is tomorrow. It's, it's October 10th, and there's been two recent surveys, one by the CDC and the other by the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. That one was out just 48 hours ago. Uh, and they are, are these statistically valid surveys that were taken during the pandemic and what they reveal uh, about the increase in stress and anxiety and, you know, stress-related disorders, including depression, is, is just phenomenal. It's affecting everybody, but it's affecting caregivers more than anyone. Uh, and let's acknowledge that this is not a small group. In the U.S. alone, there, you know, depending upon what research study you pay attention to, there are somewhere between 50 and 53 million unpaid caregivers providing $500 billion worth of care each and every year for an adult. Um, if they went away, our, our economy would crash, and 83% of them have reported an increase uh, in anxiety and depression of, of caregivers. Uh, the the 31% is for the overall population, but 80, 65% are all uh, experiencing anxiety and depressive disorders. 33% say that they have increased their use or started using uh, abusing substances since the pandemic. And 31% have seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days. So not only do we have this age wave of people who for the most part are not healthy, uh, we, we have a mental health crisis in this country right now that we have to figure out uh, how to address. So caregivers, by the way, are, are not the, the stereotypical caregiver. The majority are women uh, over the age of uh, 55, which is what we think. But one in four caregivers now are millennials, and 40% of all caregivers are, are males. So as we age, the guy on the left is 70 years old, uh, and he's pretty much the average. He's the typical guy. He's going to experience 10 years of disease and disability and morbidity uh, before he passes away at the average life expectancy of 80. Uh, the guy on the right is a little bit luckier. He's lived to 90, but he's experienced a, a, a decade of disease and disability. The guy on the far right is John Course. He's 96 years old. He sent me this photo of him when he went water skiing on his 95th birthday. Uh, I'm going to talk more about John uh, in, in just a little bit. Um, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to flatten the curve? Um, well, job number one is to change our belief system about aging because, uh, as I've said before, we are all the victims of a uh, very sub subtle form of mass hypnosis. We've been brainwashed from the time that we were born until this day. We have been exposed to this incessant ageist messaging, and it's everywhere. It's not just in the media. It pervades our culture. Uh, we hear it from our families, our friends, our, our workplaces. We believe that age is a disease, uh, and, and we have it. So if we're going to change the way we age, we have to change our belief system about aging. It's been proven conclusively that what the mind believes the body embraces. Our psychology drives our physiology. Whatever you put into your mind ends up in your body. Uh, we have to change our view of aging. Uh, one research uh, project done at Yale University proves that those who have a positive vision of aging live seven and a half half years longer than those with a negative vision of aging. Not only do they live longer, uh, but they live better. So we have to get over this form of mass hypnosis that we have all been exposed to. Age is not a disease, uh, it, it's an opportunity. Where the mind believes, the body embraces. So unfortunately, we have these uh, forms of institutional 
discrimination throughout health care, uh, negative attitudes toward older people uh, and old age among physicians, medical students, and nurses. Uh, and many of you who are young students see this. You know, it, it's stunning to me that most medical schools uh, don't offer uh, training to become a geriatrician. Uh, and if they do, they don't require a, a rotation in geriatric medicine. The result of this is that there are only 7,000 geriatricians in the U.S. today, and it's estimated that we will need nearly 30,000 by 2025. Doctors don't want to specialize in geriatric medicine because they're paid less, uh, because they don't think it's as interesting, and because they're not encouraged to, uh, and primarily because we live uh, in an ageist culture. Older people are consistently excluded from clinical trials uh, because they have uh, multiple chronic illnesses, comorbidities, uh, but it's an irony because they're the ones who these uh, clinical trials are primarily designed to help. We have got to start including older people in clinical trials. Older people are less likely to receive preventative care. Uh, they're not offered proven innovations. They're less likely to be screened. They're less likely to receive potentially beneficial surgery, all because the healthcare profession is ageist. Uh, we're not going to waste resources on people who can't take advantage of them. Uh, being old and having these, uh, these issues is just a function of aging. Uh, this is not true. Um, very obvious form of ageism is uh, offering medication before lifestyle modification. It's very, very easy to do that. So I want to start talking about what's possible. And we took this picture at the National Senior Games in 2019. You know, this was just before uh, our worlds changed. Uh, the National Senior Games, uh, largest multi-sport qualifying event in the world, bigger than the Olympics. And most of the people who come, uh, come to compete, but they come to socialize. They come to hang out. They come to celebrate their lifestyle. And I want to start with the woman in the middle. Uh, she's 93-year-old Dottie Gray. She was 94. Uh, uh, she was 94 when this photo was taken. Uh, and I wanna show you this because I spoke to a caregiving conference a while ago uh, about the power of example. When we can see someone do something that we didn't think we could do or thought we wanted to do, uh, you know, the switch goes off and then we believe it's possible. And a caregiver came up to me afterwards and said that uh, my mother broke her hip when she was 91 years old, the most vibrant woman I have ever known. Uh, and as soon as she broke her hip, she totally lost her zest for life. And I said to her, mom, what's wrong? And she said, honey, nobody my age ever comes back from a broken hip in their 90s. Uh, and this woman said to me, and she was gone within six months. She was gone. If I could show her, show her one example of an older woman in her 90s who came back from a broken hip to have a quality of life, I believe she'd still be here today. And I said, I'm going to find that woman. And it's not going to be that hard because they are out there. And so at the National Senior Games, I ran into Dottie Gray. Uh, Dottie fell out of bed when she was 93 years old, and she shattered her hip. Now her doctor told her daughter that Dottie probably would not survive surgery and if she did, most likely would never walk again. Well, she survived surgery and when she did, her therapist told her daughter, let's put her in a wheelchair and maybe at some point she will be able to be in a walker. And her daughter said, no, she wants to run again. And the therapist said, do not wish that on her. She cannot do that. After a broken hip, she will at best be on a walker the rest of her life. Well, here she is less than a year later running in the National Senior Games because they found a different therapist, because they believed uh, more was possible, because they didn't buy into the ageist messaging that is everywhere. This is what doctors say. Don't worry. It's just a normal part of aging. You've had your run. You've had your fun. Get on the couch. Uh, and, and live like a 90-year-old is supposed to live after you've broken your hip. We have to stop applying age-based characteristics to individuals. We have to stop denying medical treatment because of age. This, again, is the most diverse group of people over the age of 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100 that has ever lived. Age is not something that should be taken into consideration when you try to figure out what is possible for certain people. You know, 
this is a quote and I don't know where it comes from or I would uh, attribute it, but uh, I, I, it's absolutely true. If you've seen one 85 year old, you have seen one 85 year old. It speaks to how diverse this group is. It speaks to how diverse the potential is for people after they suffer setbacks. It speaks to how diverse uh, the opportunity is for people to uh, engage in, pursue and achieve extreme recovery. Uh, this is Kay Glenn. Kay is 68 years old now, and it's very hard to look past this picture into the background, uh, but that's a pole vaulting pit in the background. Kay is, lives on a farm in Iowa, and she has a pole vaulting pit in the cornfield. And, and Kay is a world-class masters athlete. She's a dancer, she um, is a high jumper, she's a pole vaulter, obviously. And when she was uh, in her early 60s, uh, she had such bad arthritis in both hips that she could barely walk and she certainly couldn't compete. She was in intense pain. Um, and she, it took her six months to find a surgeon who would resurface her hips uh, in a way uh, that, that, that she thought would enable her to return to competition. And this is after, this photo is after she had both of her hips resurfaced. Uh, she has bounced all the way back. This again, folks, is a 68 year old woman. Uh, which brings us, while we're talking about pole vaulting, let's go back to the National Senior Games because uh, this is 75-year-old Joe Johnson. Uh, Joe is battling two bad legs and a bad knee. Uh, one knee that's so bad it would have to be replaced uh, just six weeks after this video was taken. But he's at the National Senior Games in the pole vaulting. He's in pain. He can barely get up and down. Somehow he pulls it all together and he wins a, a national championship. Uh, in the pole vault at 75 years old. He did it because he was able to tune out all of the ageist messaging that told him he shouldn't be there. He did it because he has an attitude uh, that more and more people are having today, and it's an attitude that helps people bounce back and pursue extreme recovery. How much is Growing Boulder responsible for your success today? The Growing Boulder attitude is responsible for all of it. But you don't understand, I, I had some of that already. I was just glad I found somebody that's preaching it, man. It's like, yes. <laughs> I couldn't put it in words. I didn't have the words, but I, I got the, what do you say? I drank the Kool-Aid, all right. <laughs> this, this is the national champion, Joe Johnston, Popka, Florida. Badass number one. <laughs> yeah, he really is badass number one. And, um, you know, we're, I'm, I know I'm talking to a group of trainers and, and therapists, which is why I'm relying heavily on some of these master sports people. Um, yeah, and, and they're important because these are not genetic super freaks. These are just ordinary people who have experienced all of the setbacks that people of their age have. Now, it's just that they refuse to let life beat them down. They refuse to believe that what has happened to them uh, is strictly a function of their age. They refuse to listen to the healthcare professionals that tell them uh, they can't come back from that. And, and this is important because these are, you know, this is the tip of the spear. Uh, these these are the people that are showing the rest of us what's possible because all of those studies that, that, that showed we have to lose uh, muscle mass and bone density and VO2 max as we age at a certain requirement, um, you know, all of those studies were done with groups of sedentary older people with couch potatoes. And you know, there, there's so many people that are active now that what we're learning is, is entirely different. Uh, uh, this guy's not an athlete, uh, but this is Roselio Moon as he passed away earlier this year at the age of 106. Uh, Roselio needed a knee replacement when he was 93 years old and he had to shop to find one, which is something most 93 year olds wouldn't do. Now it took him three to four doctors before he found one that didn't look at his age, that didn't say, yeah, you're 93, just get in a wheelchair and chill. Uh, he looked at his condition, he looked at his attitude, he looked at his motivation, he looked at what he wanted to do, and he said, absolutely, uh, you deserve an E, you get an E, it's not going to be a waste. Um, and it wasn't a waste. Uh, Roselio continued to work out on a daily basis. He walked in his yard, he rode his bike, uh, and six months after he got his new knee, Roselio went on vacation. 
a 94-year-old going on vacation from Florida to Hawaii, and when he got there, he climbed up a volcanic mountain on his own and had a photo taken and, uh, and sent it to his doctor and said, see, this is what's possible. This is what you enabled for me. Uh, this is 65-year-old Susan Helmrich. Uh, Susan is a three-time cancer survivor. She was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer when she was 21 years old. Uh, her prognosis was not encouraging. Uh, she had multiple surgeries, but she battled back because she was a swimmer at the University of Syracuse, and she was active. She kept going. Uh, years later, she was diagnosed with lung cancer, even though she never smoked a cigarette in her life, and she had one of her lungs removed. Uh, and then 13 years after that, she was diagnosed with a deadly form of pancreatic cancer. Now, fortunately um, for Susan, as I mentioned, she was a swimmer. And after each surgery, and there were dozens of them, uh, she got back in the pool. It was painful. She told us there were times when I cried because I couldn't get uh, I couldn't finish one lap, but she battled through and she came back and she ended up winning national championships. And, and what kept her alive was her attitude. What kept her alive was her commitment to, to fitness. What kept her alive was her belief that more was possible even without multiple organs. My entire reproductive system, one lung, my gallbladder, my duodenum, my half of my pancreas, and the, uh, everything from my liver was rerouted. So literally, like, uh, I have many, many missing body parts, and here I am. Many missing body parts, and uh, you know she's she she is loving every day. Continues to swim. Still is not out of the clear, uh, out out of the woods. But um, you know, a great example for all of us. This guy is, is Tony Handler, who celebrated his 81st first birthday uh, by riding uh, 81 miles on his bicycle. He was diagnosed with a deadly form of pancreatic cancer more than 30 years ago. Doctor said, Tony. I got bad news for you. You're going to live two more years max. Well, since then, he's had six different kinds of cancer, including liver cancer and skin cancer. He has had nearly 30 surgeries, uh, but he became a triathlete after his first diagnosis. And since then, he's competed and completed over 300 triathletes. And they just told me I had two years to live. And I said, well, I'm not so sure I like that idea. I got to think of something I can do that to, to work on that and see if we can beat that prognosis. So I saw the Ironman triathlon and I said, you know something, that's what I think I'd like to do. And despite all the craziness that I've had with the six different types of cancer and something like 20 surgeries in between, you know, I was able to do the 296 triathlons and I, and I think that just proves that you can do whatever you set your mind to do. These are the kind of stories that we have to share. Um, with 30 and 40 and 50 year olds. If we're gonna flatten the frail elderly curve, we've got to back out of you know, just trying to treat the frail elderly and change the lifestyle of people in their 30s and their 40s uh, and their 50s. So let's go back to John Course for a second. Again, you've seen the picture on the left when he went water skiing on his 95th birthday. The picture on the right is John uh, at a swimming meet uh, at 96 years old. Uh, John was diagnosed with COVID on July 3rd of this year, obviously. He spent 10 days at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Uh, and I spoke to John on the phone just a couple of weeks ago. He was at his daughter's house, uh, and he was already back in the pool and doing Pilates after 10 days in the hospital with COVID. And here's just a little bit uh, to give you a sense of who John Course is. I think I know why you recover, but, but, but tell us, why do you think you're able to continue to not just bounce back, but maintain a quality of life that you obviously enjoy? Well, I think the main reason is I've always managed to stay active. I've been, you know, started out as a swimmer when I was two or three years old and progressed on through high school and college swimming. Um, and then I laid off for about 50 years but I continued to play a little tennis, a little golf, stayed very active. And then finally got back to Jacksonville, my friend Tiger Holmes 
persuaded me to join the master swimming program. And that really put me back into shape. And I think that's the reason that I was able to survive this thing is that my body was still strong enough to fight off whatever it is they're giving us. I think it's important, folks, to note that John Course, at 96 years old, uh, is not a superhuman being. He's a guy uh, that has a litany uh, of physical issues, but he continues to bounce back, A, because he's prehabilitated, and B, because he's got this mind that is, you know, is really, really remarkable. So, uh, John, you say swimming is what uh, helped you bounce back. Do you think you'll ever be able to get back in the pool again? Well, I've been already back in the pool. Not moving very fast, but uh, I'm trouble with my flutter kick because, in addition to all the other complaints, I hurt my back by leaning over too long. So it hurts me when I try to kick, but I just get in the pool and paddle around, go up and down, and walk back and forth. You know, one of the discussions I was having with somebody recently was about physical therapist in the aftermath of surgeries for older people and, uh, you know, discouraging older people from even attempting to walk without a walker, encouraging them to get into wheelchairs. The worst thing you can do is get on a walker into a wheelchair. That, to me, is just a death sentence because you start hanging all over like this and you can't stand up straight. Uh, that's just crazy. You don't want that old rocking chair to get you. You know, again, it, it's it's important, uh, I, I think, to, to to let you guys know that John Kors, uh, I've known him for many years. He is battling many health issues. Uh, he's had bypass surgery. He's got cardiac issues. He's on medication for that. He's got two compressed discs uh, in his back. He's got arteritis. He's got uh, uh, many, many things wrong with him. Um, multiple, multiple issues, comorbidities, uh, and yet he comes back from COVID because he was prehabilitated, which is, uh, as Dan and Cody know, one of my favorite things to talk about. Now, prehabilitation is aging's ultimate no-brainer uh, because it is a given. Without exception, every one of us is going to experience a, a series of physical setbacks as we age, and to a very large extent, uh, the types of interventions that are offered to us, the speed of our recovery, the extent of our recovery after those interventions is determined by our overall fitness at the time. Um, so, you know, if, if, if the people you're talking to don't like the word exercise, talk to them about prehabilitation. Talk to them about being able to bounce back. Uh, you know, sooner or later, something puts us uh, onto the couch, into the bed, and we don't get back from it. Uh, but we can bounce back more times and further than we know, and we see it each and every day. So uh, the power of prehabilitation rehabilitation is really, really important. And one of my favorite examples of that, and I've shown that at uh, an FAI talk before, so if you've seen it, forgive me, but I think you'll love it even if you've seen it before. This is Orville Rogers, who did pass away at 101 a year or so ago. Uh, Orville didn't start running until he was 50. He was just a businessman, um, it, but, but he kept running. And, and then he had um, surgery to open six blocked arteries, and then in 2011, when he was 93 years old, he had a major stroke. He was paralyzed on the left side of his body, uh, could barely walk, certainly couldn't run. Uh, his doctor said to him, his physical therapist said to him, his family said to him, Orville, you had a major stroke. You're 93 years old. It's been a great run. Uh, you know, you're still alive. Just sit on the couch and take it easy. And Orville said, no, 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 no. I want to come back give me the most intense rehabilitative program you can. Uh, he spent 10 days in a rehab hospital. He spent six months rehabbing on a daily basis as an outpatient. Uh, and then at 101 years old, uh, this is Orville at the National Masters Championship, seven years removed from his major stroke. He's on the left and Dixon Hempel 96 years old is on the right. Dixon, by the way, was hit by a car while he was on his bike. Uh, shattered his spine, punctured his lungs. Uh, he was in a hospital for 48 days. So here is the example of prehabilitation, 93 and 96. All 
side, 99 and 92, Orville winning by five one hundredths of a second. Uh, which brings me to the health wealth connection. You know, one of the things uh, research has shown that the biggest fear of people over the age of 60 is running out of money before we run out of time, uh, which is a very real fear. Uh, I think the people who are in the healthcare industry out there will, uh, will agree with, with, with the statement that healthcare is going to continue to get better and better, uh, genetic interventions, personalized medicine, all of this is great stuff, uh, but it is without question going to become more and more expensive. Expensive. Uh, the number one investment that everyone can make right now, uh, the number one investment that will make whatever retirement savings we have last longer, uh, the number one investment that will save us hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in the future, is to improve our overall health and well being. Uh, this is the importance of the health wealth connection. The two are inextricably linked. We can't improve one without improving the other. Uh, the poster girl for me of the health wealth connection uh, is not. 91 year old Ann Call. And I sat down recently with Ann to chat with her about that. First question is uh, what are your total health care costs over the last two years? Zero. Second question How many prescription medications are you currently on? Zero. So let's find out how you do that because uh, you really have come to represent what is possible when you leverage this health wealth connection. Uh, I don't want to ask personal questions about your, your financial situation, but I'm guessing you're not a wealthy woman. No. There are, I'm, I'm not wealthy. I have uh, Social Security. That's pretty much it. But my house is paid for, my car is paid for, so that helps. I don't have those kinds of payments, mortgage and so forth. But, and I'm very careful how I spend my money, extremely careful. So let's talk about the lifestyle choices that you make, because I know the number one thing is that, that, that you keep moving, you stay active. What kinds of things do you do? What do you believe in? I believe in uh, doing some kind of exercise every day. It doesn't have to be a lot, it doesn't have to be intense, but just a simple uh, walk for 30, 40 minutes. If you do that almost every day, that is a huge help. I just love to be active, and I find that it, it brings me happiness and um, health and strength, strength, strength to, to do what I need to do around the house, lift things, move things. One of the problems I think that we all face is the fact that we live in an ageist culture and we are subjected 24-7 uh, to messages on, on the television primarily, but, but every way it, where that tell us that uh, this is what aging is supposed to be like, that we need the help of prescription medications, that we have to be ashamed of who we are and what we look like. How do you overcome all of this incessant negative ageist messaging? I laugh out loud at the TV. When I see those pharmaceutical ads come on, all these people that look, they look so happy because they're taking these drugs. Then they tell you all of the side effects. There's a long list, including at the end, death. <laughs> okay. And then, oh, by the way, ask, tell, ask your doctor if such and such is right for you. I can't believe it. I mean, it's hysterical. Happiness is, is a big part of it. To be happy as you age, oh, it, it's, I have had the most wonderful life, full of challenges, but a fantastic life. And I'm now at the point in my life where I'm probably the happiest I've ever been because I have my freedom, my independence, and my health. What more could you ask? No, even money would not make me any happier, no. You are also a poster girl for compressed morbidity. The notion uh, that even though we may not extend the length of our life, we can all extend the period of disease and disability at the end of our life, which is really the ultimate goal. Uh, you, you, as I said, are the poster girl, and you, you mentioned dying not long ago uh, in this interview. If you were to drop tomorrow, you have not suffered a single day of disease and disability. That feels good. Yes because I think a lot of these people who are, are letting themselves uh, get to the point where they, they develop diseases that they could have prevented are very selfish because they're, they're setting themselves up to be 
a, 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 a terrible challenge for their families. Someone's going to have to take care of them eventually. So it all kind of ties back to, uh, you know, the caregiving crisis uh, that we face. And, and Anne makes a great point. 80 cents out of every healthcare dollar is now spent uh, on preventable chronic illnesses. Chronic, preventable chronic illnesses are the epidemic of our time. Now, that's what's giving way to this onslaught of frail elderly. So, you know, it all ties together, but it all begins with changing our belief system about aging. So here's a few takeaways from, from what I've talked about. Uh, we have to embrace risk-taking. Um, you know, maybe in another world, it wouldn't be considered risk-taking, but the world in which we live, it is considered risky to try to walk without a walker, uh, you know, after you've had surgery at a certain age. It might be considered risky uh, to to take up uh, a new sport at the age of 85 or 90. Uh, we have to demand extreme recovery. Extreme recovery is something nobody ever talked about uh, for people beyond a certain age. Uh, extreme recovery is possible for people of every age. We see it each and every day. Ordinary people living extraordinary lives simply because they believe that more was possible. They believed that more was possible because they were able to tune out all of the negative messaging. And, and we all know it is everywhere. It is incessant in all forms. Uh, and here's the interesting thing to me. You know, we've all heard many, many times about the power of positivity. We have to be positive. Well, you know, negative begets negative far more than positive begets positive. Positive thinking alone will not guarantee success in any endeavor, but negative thinking alone will absolutely doom anything that anyone wants to do. Uh, it's that powerful. Uh, and it's been proven. So it's not only incumbent upon us to try to think positively, we have to be an encourager and not a discourager. And one of the problems uh, with, with people of all ages, but certainly as we get older, uh, is that we become discourager, discouragers. Uh, and, and, and part of the reason for that is, is, is that, you know, we don't want to believe that more is possible because if we do, then we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. We don't want to encourage our, our spouse or our friend uh, who lives next door to, to do something because it threatens us. So if you're hanging out with people that don't encourage you, uh, you're hanging out with the wrong people. We have to avoid negativity at all costs. Community is immunity. This is uh, something that everybody is talking about now in the healthcare industry, in the insurance industry. You guys in the fitness industry know that. Uh, multiple studies, dozens of studies, uh, you know, that, that confirm that as we age, uh, low socialization is the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's more harmful to your health than alcoholism or obesity, which is certainly not an excuse uh, or permission to smoke or drink, uh, but it does underscore uh, the importance of getting together and supporting one another, which becomes more difficult as we age. People tend to stay at home. People tend to spread out. Um, so we have to work very hard to stay involved with others. We have to work very hard to help others in our neighborhood. We have to work very hard to reach out to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the widow or the widower that lives up the street and see if we can do something with them. Uh, we have to learn to adapt and accommodate, but not give up. You know, that's really the third line that should be on there. Adapt, accommodate but don't give up. Many people just, uh, you know, it's a zero sum game. It's a binary. You can do it or you can't. No, that's not the truth. You may not be able to do it the way you used to do it, uh, but you can still do it in some fashion. And this to me is the exciting part about the industry that you guys are in. Everybody is different. Uh, it, it, it's the same as that quote that I had before. Uh, if you've seen one 85 year old, you've seen one 85 year old. Everyone is different. Everyone has a, a different issue. Everyone has a different capability. Uh, everybody has a different path into finding their way forward. That's the challenge of what you're trying to do. And the challenge for us as individuals is to not give up. 
uh, and to understand. Uh, the example that I give often is of Grandma Moses, who, as we all know, when she died, she was a famous painter. Now, but she didn't start painting until she was 88 or 89. She was an embroiderer. She was a, a farm wife. She lived on a farm and she loved to embroider, but she got arthritis in her hands so bad that she couldn't handle uh, the, the little needle and do the fine needlework. Most people would have given up at the age of 89, but she put a paintbrush in her hand and she figured out she could hold that and she started to paint and she derived the same sort of satisfaction from that. The joie de vivre that kept her alive because she was able to adapt and to accommodate. Uh, we have to learn how to say yes. Uh, in the big picture, it's just saying yes to life. But when we say yes to opportunity, when we say yes to experience, when we say yes to new people, when we say yes to learning new things, when we say yes to a new class, the world opens up to us. Um, you know, we, we begin to be infused with energy and positivity. It's too easy to say no. It's too easy to say no, especially as we get older. This is the problem with senior living in general. Uh, senior living bends over backwards in these communities to offer activities for the residents, uh, but the average participation rate in their activities is 30%. Only 30% say yes to leaving their apartment and going downstairs and, and, and participating in any class. We've got to work hard to create a culture of yes. Uh, in our cities, in our communities, and in our workout groups. Uh, we need to learn to say yes in everything that we do. And we've got to have this conversation, the one that we're having now, uh, the one that Dan and Cody and FAI facilitate, you know, on a weekly basis. I, I, I get their stuff all the time. It's fascinating. And, you know, they continue to push the conversation forward. We can't change the culture if we don't change the conversation. Uh, and, and that is really something that we have to do. Uh, and uh, leverage the power of prehabilitation. Uh, you know, I always say, if you take one thing away from this, uh, you know, take this away from it. Uh, prehabilitation is banking future fitness. Prehabilitation is laying the foundation for extreme recovery. Prehabilitation uh, is, is, is an investment. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the greatest investment we can make. You know, I, I hope you saw a lot of these people whose stories I've shared today are in their 90s. You know, the 90s is, is, is the decade where it's happening. There are fewer people in their 100s that are traveling the world and competing, but they're out there. I'm going to show you one in just a minute. But in the 90s, it, it truly seems like almost anything is possible. Write a book for the first time. Take a painting and get a one-woman show in a major gallery. Uh, take up competition and win a national championship. Uh, take a trip around the world. Uh, uh, people are living big, bold lives in their 90s, and that's a message that we all need to spread. All right, you know, back to this photo. The woman on the far right uh, is Julia Hurricane Hawkins, and I'm sure many of you have heard of her. Uh, we ran into her at the National Senior Games uh, in Albuquerque in 2019 as well. Uh, this is Julia at 103 years old. She's now 104, but this is Julia at 103, becoming the oldest female to compete in a sanctioned track and field event. And, and mind you, every woman in this heat, in this final, is over the age of 93, on up to the age of 103. When we say embrace risk taking, what kind of a risk is this for a 103 year old? We talked to Julia after her race for, for quite a while, uh, you know, and asked her about, you know, her philosophy for a living. And one of the things I said to her is, weren't you afraid? You're 103 years old. You're running 100 meters. You've got cardiac issues. You have your, your, your eyesight is not great. You can barely hear. Uh, aren't you afraid that you're going to fall? Aren't you gonna afraid that you're going to have a cardiac issue? And she said, honey, I'm scared to death. Uh, but you have to look fear in the face and you have to move forward anyways. Uh, that's what aging is all about, looking fear in the face and moving forward anyway. And, you know, again, she's not a superhuman genetic freak. None of these people are. They are simply people that somehow became immune to the incessant ageist messaging, somehow had belief in themselves, somehow were fearless enough to continue to live a life. Uh, and, and what we have seen, and I've mentioned this in, in multiple ways uh, 
in this little talk is that if they do this, not only do they, they, they may not improve, let's be honest, they may not improve the length of their life. That's never a given. Uh, it's a benefit if, if you are active, if you make the right kind of lifestyle changes, but without exception, they improve the quality of their life while they lived and they shorten the period of disease and disability at the end of their life. They compress their mobility, they increase the quality of their life, and they continue to live lives that were filled with passion and purpose and socialization uh, until the very end. We call that the someone like me effect. That's how we've built our business. Not by sharing uh, statistics, which I do, as you've seen, not by sharing the opinions of experts, which I do, as you've seen, uh, but primarily by sharing the stories of ordinary people who are living extraordinary lives because it's when we can see ourselves in those people, it's when we realize it's possible for us. And I think the someone like me effect uh, uh, applies to all of us. Uh, you know, we all have to show people that how we live our lives based upon who we are can be an inspiration to them. If you're in the healthcare business, if you're in the fitness business, if you're in the rehabilitation business, uh, you need to share the stories of ordinary people that are living extraordinary lives because it helps others do the same. Uh, and with that, Dan and Cody, uh, that is it. I will stop sharing my screen and, uh, and thank you both for the time. Well, thanks so much, Mark. <clears throat> I'll hop back on here with you. Uh, do you have time to take a, a handful of questions? We've got quite a few people here live. Um, we can do that for a few minutes if you want. Be happy to. All right. So um, we do have a session starting at 1115 Eastern. So we're going to try to be out of here in 10 minutes. But uh, if you have questions for Mark or comments, uh, a lot of positive comments, of course, were coming in. Mark, people saying, you know, the risks of not engaging in exercise or resistance training are far less than the risks of, you know, participating in them. So um, folks from all around the world here, we got uh, Pakistan and uh, of course all over the U.S., all over Canada. Uh, if you didn't type in where you're from, I'd love to see that. So if you have any questions for Mark, please type those into the chat or Q&A now and uh, then we will let him go because I know you're a very busy man, um, but really appreciate your message. Uh, it's something we need to continue to hear more and more of. Um, I think people of all ages, but for sure um, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s in our field, in the physical therapy world, in the healthcare world, we need to realize that, you know, just because you've been injured or had cancer or whatever it is, you're not done, but uh, you can bounce back. But so. Well, you know, thank you, Dan. And, and I think you make a good point. One of the things I love about what you guys do and, and what Growing Boulder tries to do is that, you know, most people, whatever business they're in that create content uh, programs for older people, uh, it, it, it for somehow it doesn't seem to apply to younger people. It doesn't interest younger people. You know, you, we, we do things in a stereotypical way that feels old. And, uh, you know, my message, your message, our message is, is ageless. And, you know, what we find this kind of message uh, uh, inspires people that are in their 20s and 30s as much as it does in their 70s and 80s. And, and truth be told, that's probably where it's the most valuable because those are the ones that still have the opportunity to, to make changes in their lives. So um, yeah, it's, um, uh, I think the, the more we can be optimistic but realistic uh, about aging, the better for all of us. So we got a question about your TV show. Uh, where do we find the show? TV, cable, internet? Is it is it on PBS, uh, sort of the regular schedule? Well, well thank you for that. Uh, you go to growingbolder.com, um, and you know it has information on all of our media stuff. But but the TV show is now in its. Uh, we just began to feed our sixth season on public broadcasting stations throughout the country. Uh, so check with your local PBS station. Uh, they don't they don't all carry it i think maybe 230 of the 300 stations carry it so uh, if it's not in your market i encourage you to call your station and ask them to carry it but um you know one of the challenges with public broadcasting is they all air it at different times i wish i could yeah. tell you it's on at 7 right. p.m on but it's not but it is on 200 stations across the country and we do post uh, episodes on our website after they air so if you go to growingbolder.com and click on tv uh, we've also got a great 100 page magazine uh, that, that, that is really an inspirational piece that uh, mm -hmm. you know, people all over the world subscribe to. So you can find out about that. We've got a radio show and a podcast. So uh, yeah, 
Yeah, we and, and check out our Facebook page as well. We've got about 900,000 people who follow us on Facebook. Great engagement there. Uh, we're, we're building a community of, uh, of like-minded people who are all kind of, you know, in this together, trying to help everybody live big, bold, active lives. Yeah, I'm looking around in my office because your magazine is is tremendous. I love your magazine. Um, I, I record the Growing Boulder show because you're right. It's not a, a necessarily a, a routine schedule. So I just have it set to record. Um, you know, my DVR takes care of that for me. So I think in Indiana, it's on on Sundays pretty regularly. So I um, well, appreciate that. Hey, Mark, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not coming on video here, but this is several people have mentioned this in the chat and Q&A. And this is the question. I get a lot when I speak. It's the $1 billion question mark, right? So all this great positivity, but how do you get older adults who are already in that mindset that they're old, that they're done with, how do you turn that around? Because these are people that we know and love who we just see they have so much potential, but they've already bought in to the negative aging narrative. How do we turn that around for those people? Uh, it is the billion dollar question and I don't want to sound self-serving, uh, but, but that's exactly what we built our business on is the understanding that there is the need for something that will help people change their mindset and what we have found again, uh, the thing that does it the most is, is to share, show them examples of people like them. Uh, and I mean that literally, um, you know, if, if, if you want to convince a 92 year old African American woman that she can come back from such and such show her an example of another uh, exactly like her not easy to do it takes a long time to do it but that's what growing boulder magazine is about uh, I know that's what all of your trainers do I, I'm assuming uh, if you have success with someone of some age uh, you share that story you share that example so uh, it, it is easy and and you hear it all the time if you're just talking to a loved one and saying you know mom uh, you know, you, you, you got to keep going. It's possible. Uh, it, it's in one ear and out the other. If, if you can show them examples of that and let them understand and believe that they truly can overcome it. Uh, and, and this is the challenge. I mean, th th this is the result of this incessant messaging. We all believe at a subconscious level uh, that the, the things we experience beyond a certain age are, are just a natural part of aging and, it, and that it's, you know, just silliness uh, to think that more is possible. So uh, I, there, there is no quick and easy answer, Cody, uh, but, but the thing that we found that works the best uh, is, is to share stories of, of other people. And, you know, so the, to the extent that you can aggregate those and share those, uh, the more success you'll have. Okay, we got a question from actually a, a, a national senior games participant from last year in Albuquerque, and uh, Mark is asking about the cost benefit analysis of staying in good health. Like, have you guys measured or looked at, like, what, what's the cost? I mean, you, you showed the example of, the, the, of Anne who said her healthcare costs were zero last year, right? I mean, is there a, yeah. a massive gap between those who are maintaining their health and fitness and, and those who are not? You know, it's a really good question, and uh, it, it would be great to have some sort of uh, verifiable evidence, uh, you know, not just for Growing Boulder, but for FAI as well. Um, you know, it's, it's mostly anecdotal from our perspective, because that's not what we do, but that would be a useful tool, uh, and if that was Mark who asked it, thank you for, for asking that. Um, uh, but, 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 but yes, I think it would, would be difficult, but probably very possible to figure that out, what the average health, and, and I've, I've read that, the average health care cost per year uh, for someone beyond the age of 65 up until they die is this, uh, uh, and then you bring in enough people like Ann Calls who are living solely on Social Security and probably have a better quality of life than most people, we could probably figure that out. I'm going to make a note of that, Mark, and, uh, and, and I appreciate the question. Uh, Amy asks about sort of your non-traditional athletes. She's even curious if you ever have highlighted dancers or, you know, sort of the non-fitness. I'm sure there are people that you've profiled that are active, but not necessarily, you know, athletic or, or even exercise enthusiasts. Other activities you've, you've looked at? Oh yeah, and we do all the time, and um, and yes, and we've realized that we have to do that because again, you know, people want to make gross generalizations, and and you know, it, it's easy if I show you 
the people that I showed you today, for the most part, then it's easy for someone to dismiss that and think, well, these are all just, they live that way just because they're, they're athletes. Uh, but but acti acti we, we, we've done stories on people that just walk. Uh, we've done many stories on dancers. I mean, they're, they're athletes, so I don't know that they're different from the ones that I've showed you. But, uh, you know, we, we are trying very hard. And, and Dan, as you know, the pandemic has made it difficult for everybody, you know, to get out and expand and do more stories, but um, activity of any sort is beneficial, even if it's, you know, just walking around your house, but socialization is critical. We're doing stories on quilting bees. Uh, we're doing stories mm -hmm. on Mahjong groups. We're doing stories on, on people now uh, who are unable to get together in person and are doing it uh, you know, it's one, of, it's, it's one of the great benefits of this pandemic is it has forced older people who are willing to try or who have someone who will help them to communicate uh, online in a digital world. You know, we all know Zoom is exploding. Uh, Google Meets is exploding. So yeah, we're telling stories about people that are not just physically active, but mentally active all the time. And, and we'll continue to do more of that. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, um, this has been great, Mark. I, I'm sure we could take Q&A here for probably another hour, but we have more sessions coming up live at 1115. Um, if you're in this session right now, remember you have to go back and refresh the page. You're gonna have three options for sessions at 1115 with three um, equally interesting speakers and topics. Um, Mark, as always, thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, we, we so appreciate at FAI what Growing Boulder is doing and how you continue to further that aging is an opportunity. Uh, and I quote you often on that, right? Aging is not uh, a negative thing. It's not a disease. It's not a time to be sick or frail, but aging is an opportunity. And it's an opportunity to be embraced. So, Mark, thank you so much. Um, be well. You bet. And thanks, everyone. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank Cody. Uh, Kelly Hollywood just said thanks. Amy Vick says thanks. Thank you to you guys. Uh, I enjoyed it. Let's stay in touch. I know we're all really, really busy, but uh, yeah, there, there's great synergy uh, in what we're doing and, and we're big fans. So thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.